Hey, everybody, what's going on? It's Dugout Talk. We're back here with Cameron Lingle and Steven Gossman. All right, we're going to switch things up a little bit. Um, to jump into this, we got a little baseball in history. Um, I'll go ahead and, and start us off with uh, a day that probably modern baseball wouldn't be the same without today in 1936 um the baseball writers association of america the bbwaa and uh, a special group of uh former players former managers former people of the game um who had knowledge of 19th century baseball players um known as the veterans committee came together and decided that the very first uh, Hall of Fame induction ceremony would take place in 1939 because uh, they didn't have the museum in Cooperstown built yet. <clears throat> and you will never believe the group that they decided to be the very first Hall of Fame uh, bunch. I'll just I'll just list off the names here. You got Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, Honus Wagner, Christy Mathewson, and Walter Johnson. Talk about a class right there. He's that that is an insane that is an insane group of people right there. Mm-hmm. And I think an honorable first class to ever be inducted. Yeah. Um Cooperstown is still a dream. I'd love to go there someday. Hopefully, Same. hopefully sooner rather than later. But yeah. Um, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit oh on boy. our day in history. Uh, because I don't know if you heard yesterday, but the Milwaukee Brewers, uh, they made they made history by making Sarah Goodrum the first woman in major league baseball to be a minor league hitting coordinator. So she's overseeing all hitting operations within the minor league system of the brewers. Hmm. Uh, So basically her role is she'll manage the hitting coaches at the team's affiliates. And then uh, also part of her job title is when the coronavirus pandemic fades, she'll travel around the system to assist in player instruction. Um, Sarah Goodrum was a college softball player with the Oregon Ducks. She's been with the Brewers organization since 2017. And to get this honor at the age of 27 is absolutely incredible. It's paving the way for women in baseball. We've seen since last year, a couple teams promoting women to their coaching staffs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most recently we saw the Red Sox do that with Bianca good. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, this is honestly yesterday was a very historic day, and I think sooner rather than later, kind of like how back in the um, like in the nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, when mm-hmm. Negro League players started making major league teams, I think we're going to start seeing women on just about every major league coaching staff, if not all of them, within the next five years. I would say. Yeah, and I tell you what, like it's only a matter of time until until we get until we get women in, in, you know, the game as players. I, I look forward to the day. I, I think it would be, I think it would be a great achievement, um, not only for the game, but for sports in general uh, to finally have like a true co-ed sport. Um, I, don't, I don't know if co-ed's the right word, but a truly, a truly mixed sport where anybody, any, any race, any ethnicity, any, any gender can come in and, and compete and compete at a high enough level um, to, to make a major league roster, I think would be, it would be fitting for baseball to be that sport. So I have a distant cousin. He actually used to pitch in the independent leagues back in the mm-hmm. early 2010s. And he was part of at the time, what was the Hawaiian independent league um Mm. they would travel they would they mostly played in hawaii but they did some stints in japan throughout the season and then they came over to like the continental 48 and -hmm. played some games and there was a knuckleball pitcher on his team who was a female okay i cannot remember her name for the life of me um but that was i think that was the first instance i heard of a woman playing in any kind of professional baseball organization yeah I am looking forward to that day too, when we see the first woman in a major league game. Um, I'm not sure how popular or consistent that's going to be, but I, I can't wait for that day either. If anything, I do believe that someday we're going to see a woman at the helm managing a baseball club. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 
if anything, if maybe we don't see the day that a woman plays on a major league field, I yeah. really believe that soon we're going to see a woman in the dugout managing a team, which I am I am absolutely excited for. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. I want to I want to see that come into fruition. Yeah, awesome. So there you go. Um, two two very historical moments, um, only separated by like, what almost eighty five years. years. Yeah, eighty five years. years. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, we'll jump into our last uh, AL East team uh, for this week. Uh, looking at the, the the first place Tampa Bay Rays from last season, uh, they went forty and twenty, made it all the way to the World Series with the Dodgers. Took them all the way down to the wire. Um, lost in a heartbreaker. Uh, the Dodgers' first World Series in, in decades, but the Rays. Uh, they had seemingly everything clicked for them last season. Like they, the timely hitting was there. The timely pitching was there. You know, their, their, their starting staff was bolstered by Charlie Morton and Blake Snell. They had all oh, the timely hitting from seemingly everybody. Brandon Lau, he, he was, he was a star, a star stud player most of last season. Randy Arena. He showed up and just started balling out in the postseason. You know, seemingly, seemingly everybody, um, even Mike Brasso, who, you know, myself included, most Yankee fans probably aren't very fond of um, at this moment, <laughs> or or will be fond of for the next few moments. Um, but, but yeah, everything went right for them. They they took it all the way down to the wire. Um, nearly, nearly won the World Series, but. Uh, you look at how they how they have gone through their their off season to this point. Um, they let Charlie Morton walk in free agency. He signed a contract with Atlanta, a one year deal. They traded Blake Snell to uh, San Diego for a a good a good list of prospects, um, headlined by Luis Patino, which we'll cover um, a little later on. They traded uh, Jose Alvarado to Philadelphia. Uh, they let Hunter Renfro walk. He went to Boston. So they've, they've lost a couple guys and outside of Trevor Richards, uh, Michael Waka, they really haven't gone out and acquired too many outside pieces. So this is a team that's going to on paper, you know, they lost a, a few, you know, relatively important guys. Um, I don't know if you want to give your thoughts on how they, how they've, you know, played out last season and how their off season is going. Um, but go ahead. So I mentioned this yesterday. I think what the Rays did last year was legitimate because they put up back-to-back 90 win seasons previously. So I think this team had what it was capable of. I don't think winning the division was a fluke by any means. Would they have mm-hmm. gotten to the world series last year in a full season? Maybe, um, everything really did play out well for the Rays last year, uh, just all around in those 60 games. So, but there's no doubt in my mind that the group that they had would have made an impact in the postseason. Mm-hmm. Now to go into the off season uh, there, I think Blake Snell in a lot of ways really wanted out of Tampa because yeah. the way the Rays lost the world series last year was extremely unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Rays really opened up analytics to baseball, in my opinion. They kind of became the first team to embrace the analytics um, and how managers go about running business nowadays on a team to field a winning team out there. And Kevin Cash got so analytical that he messed up and took Blake Snell out of a game six World Series with the Rays down by one game. Mm -hmm. You know, he took he took him out in the then before he could get three times through the order and what happened the raised bullpen imploded and imploded. and i mean it didn't make sense because when you look at the analytics snell was actually a better pitcher third time through the order last year yeah and so cash really screwed the pooch and i think in a lot of ways snell wanted out because that would be really frustrating to be part of that and it kind of makes me wonder if there were some other guys within the team like Hunter Renfro um, mm-hmm. that ended up, they didn't really want to be back on the team because of 
that decision making by Cash. And that's not to say that Cash is a terrible manager because he's he's proven that he can do the job. Yeah. But he really out he outthunk himself, if that's even a word. I don't know if that's a word or not. Um I'll make it a word for now yeah, just to prove go. the point. But and considering that this was the Dodgers. And the Dodgers, Dave Roberts has made some very questionable moves in the playoffs Mm -hmm. and World Series over the years. Cash pulled a David Roberts. Roberts didn't even need to do anything last year because Cash did it for him. Yeah. Um, And so I think kind of looking at how the offseason has gone for the Rays and looking at what the Yankees and the Blue Jays have done, I think this team is still going to be competitive, but to say that they're going to do what they did last year and the previous two seasons – I don't really see a lot of that happening again, unless if everything goes well for them, like it did last year. Um, So I guess that's mostly my thoughts on the team itself. And they have really taken a step back, losing Morton and Snell in the rotation, but unless if they decide that they're going to go with the opener for most of the year, they, Mm -hmm. I guess Tyler Glasnow is really the only starter they need, but Glasnow is a, is a ticking time bomb with that elbow. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he had some elbow issues in 2019 shortened season last year. wasn't that big of a deal, but, uh, I'm a little worried that in a full season, he might start dealing with arm issues again. And if that's the case, the Rays don't really have another starter on the table right now. And it kind of seems like at this point, they're relying on that opener to get them through the season when glass now can't take the hill. Yeah, I, I will give Kevin Cash Kevin Cash um, credit. He lived by the analytics and he died by the analytics. You know, at least he at least he kept with the the culture that they have. Yeah, sure, it didn't it didn't win them the World Series, but it got them there, um, and it's consistently got them to the playoffs the last couple seasons. So I will at least give him credit for that. Um, you know, maybe maybe you know, given a, a second opportunity, maybe he goes with his gut. Um, or maybe he sticks with the analytics and, you know, that'll be something that we can find out um, if they make the postseason again. Um, but to kind of jump into their, to their projected lineup, uh, how their hitters look uh, largely the same, uh, really, this is essentially just their, their playoff roster, um, their playoff lineup, so to speak. Uh, I got, I've got uh, Austin Meadows leading off playing DH. I have Brandon Lau at second base. Uh, hitting third, I have Randy Arozarena taking over left field. Uh, I've got G-Man Choi in the cleanup hole uh, playing first. I have Manny Margo at right field batting fifth. Batting sixth, I got Joey Wendell at third base. Batting seventh, I have Willie Adamas at shortstop. Hitting eighth, I have Kevin Kiermeyer in center field. And hitting ninth, rounding out the order, is Mike Zunino at catcher. I'm not sure if Zunino – I don't know how much they um, expect from uh, Francisco Mejia, who they got in the Blake Snell trade. Um, I'm not sure how much they expect him to compete for that opening day catcher's role. I, th- I guess it's possible that he could win it. Um, I-, I would root for him to win it. I've been a big fan of – of Francisco Mejia since he was in the you know, the lower levels of the the, uh, the um, Indian system, so. But I think I gave the the edge out to Mike Zunino simply because he's been there for a couple for a couple years now. Yeah, the Rays the Rays are actually in a good position on the catching side. I think because they also have Kevin Smith, mm-hmm. and Smith has a pretty good resume between the White Sox and Angels. Um, yeah. So they have three potential catchers. Yeah. The good thing about Mejia, too, is he can play the outfield if yes. necessary. So he doesn't need to be behind the plate. Um, but I'm not really sure what the Rays are looking at as far as that goes. And my lineup actually looks a little different than okay. yours does. Uh, I do have Austin Meadows as the DH leading off. I have Randy Rosarena hitting second, actually, okay. in left field. G-Man Choi, the first baseman, will probably hit third. And this one might surprise you, but I was looking at the playoff lineup last year Mm -hmm. and the Rays consistently went with Manuel Margot in the cleanup spot, even though he's not a traditional number four hitter because the number three, four, five, and six spots in the lineup traditionally are guys who can hit power. Um, Although we have seen 
a little different over the years where sometimes teams will throw in a good on base percentage guy mm-hmm. at the three or four hole, even though they may not be power hitters. But I've got Manuel Margot hitting fourth in right field. Um, Brandon Lau, the second baseman, batting fifth. Willie Adamas at short, batting sixth. Kevin Kiermeyer in center, batting seventh. I have Mike Zanino hitting eighth behind the plate, and then Joey Wendell hitting ninth at third base. And okay. I. I constructed that lineup because it's lefty righty alternate. Mm. And as I look kind of at what the bench holds for the race too, yeah. I imagine that Francisco Mejia is probably going to get a roster spot. I think Mike Brasso mm. Mike Brasso is going to get a roster spot. Yoshitomo Susugo mm-hmm. is likely going to get on. And then Yandy Diaz. Um, the Rays are actually pretty well balanced yeah. on the offensive side yeah. of things. I could argue because they have a good combination of righties. They have a good combination of lefties. They can go matchup based. I think that's what makes this team so good is they can easily put a lineup together that favors right-handed pitching or right-handed pitching. And they can put a lineup together that favors left-handed pitching and also put a good defense out there too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why this lineup was so hard to construct because they literally could do anything with anyone that makes that opening day roster. Um, pretty much all the guys they have can be starters. Mm. Uh, They can come off the bench if needed. There's really no right answer or wrong answer really with what the Rays can do. And I don't think we're going to consider, I don't think we're going to see guys consistently hitting in one spot of the lineup or the other. I think guys are going to be flipped around as the year goes on. Um, But just kind of looking at what they did in the postseason, it's, I think that's likely going to be the case is we're going to see guys hitting in really weird spots that you traditionally wouldn't see them in like mm-hmm. Manuel Margot, for example. Yeah. He's, he seems like either, at least when he was in San Diego, he was primarily a leadoff guy who yeah. sometimes at the bottom of the order, but since he's gone to Tampa, they put him in the middle of the order. Um, and it's worked out pretty well for them for the most part. So that's why I think he's probably going to hit, be the number four guy just to kind of give that balance between lefty and righty and lefty um in the lineup yeah my my guess is that he's probably got some good uh some good metrics i'm sure if, if you look into it maybe he's got a, a good hard hard contact percentage um so maybe he's maybe he's a guy that hits hits the ball hard um i haven't i haven't watched enough of uh manny margo outside of, of of you know some typical highlights but i'm assuming that he's probably you know he's, he's very fast um he's good in the field and I'm assuming that he's got, you know, like I said, just enough uh, hard contact rate to, you know, some of those, some of those hard hit balls are going to land. And with guys that are, you know, high on base in front of him, you know, there's a good chance there may be one, two, or even three guys on when he comes up. So, you know, that's always a good possibility. Um, and speaking of, I, I re- speaking of their bench, um, I really, I really like Yoshitomo Sutsugo. Um, I've been a fan of him since he was in Japan. I watched him in the World Baseball Classic, and and fell in love with the guy. So it was a little upsetting to see the Rays be the team that he goes to, but <laughs> I would love nothing more than to see him him succeed, uh, regardless of where he is. I think it would be awesome if he could find his way um, into this lineup uh, somewhere somehow. Um, so yeah, that, that would be, that's, that's definitely someone that, that I like to watch for. I know he didn't, he didn't get to play much last season. Um, but I look for, I look for Yoshitomo Sutsugo to, uh, to have a relatively good and surprising 21. His biggest thing is going to be, he's going to have to cut down on the strikeouts. Yes. I'm looking at, I'm looking at his inside numbers right now. And he had, he struck out 27% of the time last year yep. in uh, how many plate appearances in 185 plate appearances. So yeah. um, I he's think spring training, yeah, he's got some stuff to work on, but I think spring training is going to be huge for him in that way, because Absolutely. it's, it's going to be a chance for him to show that he can be, a consistent presence in the lineup. And that's the nice thing about him being on the Rays is, you know, he can, he can easily start against a right-handed hitter mm-hmm. or a right-handed pitcher um, since he bats left-handed. So he can easily still be in the lineup and then he just needs time to prove that he's actually capable of not real, or he's capable of being able to be a consistent hitter, make that, 
a uh, consistent impression, I guess, to the coaches and to Kevin Cash on why he needs to be in the lineup on a daily basis. Yeah. And a fun fact, um, as I was looking, as I was looking at some, uh, some 21 projections on fan graphs, I noted that uh, I, I believe we have the same, we don't have the same lineup, but we have the same guys in the lineup, correct? Yes. Seven of those nine players, they acquired via trade. Seven of their nine starting, uh, you know, hitters were acquired via trade. I thought that was a crazy number. I expected, I expected to see like seven of nine being homegrown guys, but no, seven of their nine starting, starting fielders um, were acquired via trade. And the thing, the thing too, with that is, um, they actually, I guess you could argue they develop. They did the final developments yes. on most of these guys, like a Rosarena, Meadows, uh, Zanino. They were all rather young players before getting traded. So, yeah, that is crazy to think, though. It doesn't really feel like it, considering how yeah. young these guys were. But um, that is that is an interesting note, definitely. Yeah. And it's just kind of how, just kind of how the Rays do business. You know, I mean. And it, it looks bad now having having traded Blake Snell and Jose Alvarado, but who knows? In, in three or four years, we may be talking about Luis Patino being better than Blake Snell um, ever could have been in Tampa Bay. That just kind of yeah. seems to be their luck. That's the beauty of baseball too; is it can't yeah. work out like that. Yeah. All right, jumping over to their uh, their starting rotation. Um, it's not one that's going to jump out at you. Um, any more at least, but you know, Tyler Glass now, obviously the ace of that staff. Uh, so long as he can stay healthy, he should be fine. He's got a blistering fastball and just a, a break your knees curveball um, that he just kind of one two punches you with. Uh, I got him slated at the number one spot. I have the newly acquired Trevor, Ri- Trevor Richards in the number two hole. I think he could be a good. Uh, kind of innings eater. I know he's coming off. Previously had some, uh, some, some. I believe a, a Tommy John surgery um, two years ago. Now, I've got Ryan Yarbrough at the number three hole. I suspect that he may get paired with an opener. Um, I know that he was typically, typically like the follower for them um, in the past couple of years. I don't know if they're going to kind of go more traditional with him or not. Uh, moving forward, but I've got him at the number three hole. Um, I have Michael Walk as the number four starter. Uh, they just got him from the Mets uh, via free agency. Uh, he's a guy that I think with their they have a, a stellar pitching coach um, and they have a stellar uh, just staff in general uh, that that really really seems to get a lot out of out of pitchers. So I wouldn't be surprised if he kind of doesn't regain his his form that he had in his early days in uh, St. Louis, but I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't put up decent numbers with an ERA around four, maybe just under. Uh, He should be a good addition to their, a sneaky good addition to their rotation. And then in the number five spot, I have Josh Fleming slash opener. Um, I, I suspect that that'll probably be much more open to openers than the rest of the rotation will be um and then i know that whether it's this year or next year they will have brent honeywell and brandon mckay um who you know if they if they do play this year i haven't looked into their injuries but i know they are injured um if they do play at some point this year i suspect that they uh the first the first openings in that rotation should be either yarbrough or fleming but that's 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 kind of how i i constructed mine there yeah, this one was difficult for me to construct just because it's hard to say what the Rays are actually yeah. going to do. Um, but I do have Tyler Glass now as their opener or as the, the opening day guy. I have yeah. Michael Walker slated number two, okay. I think, because I imagine Walk is probably going to get more innings than mm-hmm. um, like he'll – they'll treat him as an actual starter. So I think – they have two guys traditionally in the starting rotation. Uh, Ryan Yarbrough, I've got him as the number three, but I think he's also going to have an opener to some degree because that's kind of mm-hmm. what they've been doing with him. I have Josh Fleming as their four, and I think he'll probably be in an opener's case as well. And then number five, 
I could easily just see them going like a bullpen day kind of thing. But if mm-hmm. I had to pick someone and look kind of looking at it on fan graphs based on what they have projected, I've got Brent Honeywell as their number five okay. at the moment. Um, but I easily see this team doing more of like a, like an opener style sure. have like traditional two starters, but then they can flip flop for the other three spots, what they're going to do um, when they're, if they're going to actually start someone or if they're going to just put an yeah. opener out there and then bring in their starter later to do the middle innings or something like that. Yeah. I know that they don't, they don't usually stick with a tactic for more than a couple of years. So I wouldn't be surprised if they go to some, some other groundbreaking uh, strategy and, and, you know, kind of leave openers behind um it's it's a possibility but yeah because i know i know that you know the use of openers peaked in 2019 and we saw kind of less of it last year so it's always possible that it it might go down might come back up but the full season might stay you know about the same um, in terms of usage per game but jumping over to their uh, bullpen uh, I think Pete Fairbanks has done enough to earn the closer's job there in, in St. Pete. Um, he was phenomenal in the postseason last year. Um, I know more often than not, when, when he came in to face the Yankees, I usually just, if I was watching the game, I'd usually just turn it off. Cause at that point in time, the game's already over um, <laughs> between, between him, Nick Anderson Diego Castillo, Ryan Thompson, obviously they had Alvarado last year. Um, they don't have him anymore, but I think, I think they're, they have a big four with Fairbanks, Anderson, Castillo, and Thompson. I think those are going to be their four most important uh, bullpen guys. And I think that, uh, I think that anyone that they put with them is strictly complimentary. Uh, I think they're going to mix with a lot of young guys. They're going to mix with a lot of openers, um, and they'll probably end up having a few long relief guys come in there and help them out uh, there as well. But yeah, I think their I think their bullpen is going to be another another huge asset for them going into twenty one. I agree with that, and I think kind of like what I was saying with them mixing in openers with starters. Um, I easily see a lot of the guys that they use as quote unquote in the starting rotation. They're probably going to see bullpen time as well, like Yarbrough and Fleming and Honeywell. Um, I think Castillo, Anderson, Fairbanks, and Thompson, yes, I agree that they're going to probably be four locked-in guys Mm -hmm. in the bullpen. I could easily see them mixing around the closer duties too. Um, Sure. I didn't really watch the Rays a lot last year, so I'm not familiar with how that looks, but Fairbanks does seem like a good fit for the closers role. Castillo also seems like a good Mm -hmm. fit for the closers role. Um, Ryan Sheriff is another guy I've got my eye on. I think he's going to make an impact on the team. John Curtis is probably going to make an impact on the team. Uh, They've got a top prospect in Shane McClanahan, who Mm -hmm. is probably going to play a role and he can also be a starter too. So he might be in that mix of an opener, slash starter slash middle reliever and then trevor richards of course yep. he's another guy i can see um making the team andrew kittredge is another guy i've got my yeah. eye on um he made he had a small role on the team last year and i think he has like he has a good chance to make that opening day roster and then whenever they get brendan mckay back um the nice thing about McKay, and I'm not sure if they're still open to doing this, but he's also a position player. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they use him over the course of the year when he comes back, if they're going to primarily use him as a pitcher or if they're going to actually put him out in the field. Um, that's something I'm curious to see, just to see how that works out. Um, Yaxel Rios is another guy mm-hmm. to keep an eye on as well. He's currently injured too so i'm not sure how much of a factor he's going to play into the Rays this year but they do have some legitimate prospects in that bullpen that can make a that could play a part um but it seems pretty open right now for the most part too as to who's going to actually get spots and where guys are going to be as far as their uh position goes with the bull or with the bullpen over the course of the year yeah their bullpen is going to be very open it's going to fluctuate a lot in terms of who's in it and uh the usage that each guy gets i think it's going to be um yeah very very open they're going to send a lot of guys down they're going to bring a lot of guys up 
um, I think it's that's kind of that's kind of going to play. It's going to help play into that bullpen success is that they're always going to have guys that you don't get to see often. You know, they're always going to have guys that you may only face two or three times a season. And each of those two or three times, they're just going to light you up. So yeah, yeah it's going to be, it's going to be crazy, but jumping, jumping over to probably, you know, cons- you know, um, the word I'm looking for uh, annually, I guess I'll say uh, they're, their best the best thing about the rays the thing they do the best is development and their prospect list shows that they've got probably the best farm system in baseball if not it, at the very least the best in the al um wander franco the perennial number one overall prospect you know he he figures to probably see some mlb time this season um I think with an injury, maybe he should see some some starting time, maybe even. But I think there's a good chance that at some point this season he'll make his his major league debut. Um, you also got Luis Patino, which figures in the next in the next two or so years should have a, a starting role locked down, uh, whether it be in the bullpen or whether it be in the rotation. I'm sure they'd like him to be in the rotation, um, so that's something to look for with him. Uh, they also have, like we were, like we were just talking about, Brent Honeywell, Brandon McKay, two of their other very highly touted uh, pitching prospects. They're both currently injured, um, but I believe they should see both of them back at some point in time this season. Uh, and then just one more pitching prospect because why not? Uh, Shane Baz, another guy that I think has a uber bright future um, in baseball. Yeah, I'll add Shane McClanahan to that as well because yeah. uh, he seems to be in the cards right now for an opening day spot on the on the roster. Uh, I agree with you on the Rays. I think they have, I think they definitely have the best farm system in the American League East. I would maybe argue that the Tigers have the best farm system in the American League. Uh, by the way, the top 100 prospects list came out yesterday, and Detroit yeah. has five guys in the top 25. Yeah. How, oh, wow, in top 25. In how top 25. Did, how many did the Rays have in the top 100? I did not see okay. exactly. I, I, be- I, I believe either. it's three, but okay. I could be wrong on that. But anyway, back on back on the Rays, mm-hmm. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I am super jealous of Wander Franco because he's only yeah. 19 years old. Yeah. And he is the number one overall prospect in all of baseball. And he has a chance, like you said, to see some major league time this year. Now, granted, yeah. he's only in single A or advanced single A. He's with the yeah. Charlotte team. Um, but I was kind of thinking about it. And Willie Adamas seems to be the everyday shortstop there right now. Mm-hmm. If Adamas were to get hurt for some reason, easily I could see Franco being on the team come opening day. Um, other than that, I would hope that the Rays would be smart about this and just let him spend this season in the minor leagues, especially since there wasn't a minor league season last year, let him actually get those reps in that he needs. Um, If necessary, call him up for September, you know, let him get a, let him get a brief stint up in the minor or up at the major league level come September. Maybe if the Rays are in postseason contention at that point, see if he's good enough to actually make the postseason roster. Mm -hmm. Um, but the fact that he's only 19, yeah. you know, it, it, I don't think there's really any reason to rush him at this point. Let him develop into the star that they think he's going to be because for a team like the Rays, they're a small market team. They want it. And to be honest, they not that they don't have terrible fans, but they do not get enough attraction. Um, and it doesn't help that their ballpark just sits in this really yeah. congested part of Tampa Bay. Tampa, um, which by the way, they're trying to get, I don't know if you've seen the stadium plans that they've released. Yeah, just yesterday. Even the stadium plans are like, I don't see how they can redevelop that part of town um, because they would have to just completely tear down the trop and tear down surrounding areas if they're going to stay in that area. And I know they've had some issues with trying to get a new ballpark. They had a plan in Ybor City that Mm-hmm. looked really good on paper but really it fell good. through um so i know that 
the Rays kind of have a really bright future ahead of them. They're also trying to get their ballpark situation figured out. But the thing with Wander Franco is they have a golden, they have a golden piece right here. That could yeah. be a big part of their future. This is probably the most hype they've had around one single player since Evan Longoria. Yeah. So if you're the Rays, I get you want to bring this guy up so you can bring some fans in because it seemed like during the Longoria prime days, that was when they were at their peak in attendance yep. at the Trop. And even with them winning now, um, yeah, they got a good turnout in 2019 for the postseason. I think Rays fans do a great job of showing up during the playoffs. It's just regular season you know, you can hear a pin drop in that place sometimes. Yeah. Um, but with Franco, they if you if the team is to rush him up to the major leagues before he has time to develop, he this could quickly turn into a disaster for them. And um, as desperate as they may be to get him on the major league club, I think it, they would it would be in their best interest to just ride it out let him actually let him actually fully develop because like I said he's only 19 years old he's got plenty of time there's no need to rush him Willie Adamas is doing great at the shortstop Mm -hmm. position so it's not like they need an immediate upgrade there and I imagine that Franco's probably going to play other infield positions too Um, I don't know if Adamas is a guy they see as their whole future Um, I know they were really high on him too when he first came up for good reason but Franco is kind of like he's the number one guy right now in all of baseball yeah. and they have a grand opportunity to make him into a perennial star, maybe even better than Evan Longoria was. Um, so I really, as much as I would love to see him in the majors this year at the same time, let the kid develop and let him actually um, build up his value. If that makes sense to you at all. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it would be it would be a tremendous success if he saw major league time this year because that means that he is ready. I don't see them bringing him up. You know, they're they're usually pretty smart about how they deal with their prospects. So I don't see him making his major league debut until Ray's management and Ray's ownership in general um, thinks that he really is ready. I know that they probably more than just about any other team with how small of a market they have there. Like they probably value um, major league service time more than just about anybody else. So I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see him at all this year. And instead they decide to hang on to him um, until they can pass kind of that, that threshold in April of next year. I know that there's a certain date in April where if you call a guy up like directly after it, you gain a whole extra year of service time. It's a little bit of a little bit of a shady business move, but it's a move that teams made, you know, all the time. It, it it is kind of shady, but it's not the worst thing in the world either. And I think in a case like Franco, they would probably benefit from having that extra year Mm -hmm. of service time with him. Um, But yeah, I don't think if he does make the major league team this year, fantastic. That would be, that would be, I'd be really happy for the Rays if he was able to make it on the major league team, but it's not a loss either. Just cause, just cause MLB pipeline has him. Making, yeah. They say that he's expected to be on the team this year. It doesn't mean if he doesn't make the team, it's yeah. a lose, lose. No, he's like I said, and I'll keep saying it. He's 19 years old. You have the kid yeah. a chance to develop and build his value and actually be the perennial ball player that they want him to be. Mike Trout wasn't 19 when he debuted. Yeah. Bryce Harper was, but Trout wasn't. And Trout is arguably the best player in baseball Mm -hmm. 10 years later. Yeah. Um, Yeah. The reason why I think it would be a huge success if he debuted this year is because that means that he got past single A and dominated. It would mean that he had to have, you know, in in the short time he would spend in double A, he'd have to dominate. And in the short time he would spend in triple A, he'd have to really dominate. You know, we're talking like, a 350 batting average, 330, 325, something like that, just light the world on fire. And that's that's why it would be a success is because then you know this guy can not only hit, but he can dominate minor league players. And that's, that's what a major league uh, player, if not a major league all-star, should be able to do is, is face minor league talent and just dominate them. So if he, if he debuts this year, I think he will have had to dominate 
each of you know high a double a and triple a i think that's the only way that he would debut this year if not maybe they look to move uh willie adamas next winter i know he's probably coming up on his his fifth or sixth year already um so they would probably trade him get some prospects in return and then you know he you know uh their uh franco would be ready come you know mid to late april get that extra year of service time he plays almost a full season and you know everyone kind of goes home happy one quick note on franco he yeah. he has been killing it in the lower minor leagues yeah. right now he's hitting yep. he's a 336 hitter so far in the minors so i would think i don't even know if spring training is going to matter necessarily he's probably going to be in double a at the start yeah. of the year um if not well no nah, i'd say he'll probably be in double a at at best maybe start him in single a for a little bit but mm-hmm. um also with willie adamas he's a free agent in 2025 so he's got plenty of oh, time okay. still um he's been he's been in the big league since 2018 which i thought i thought he'd been around longer too. i, I was gonna say i was i thought he was one of those guys that like man i can't believe you know like it's like already five years or something like yeah that. it feels like he's been around long. longer but he's only yeah. been up on the big league team for three years um and i think adamas could be he might even be able to move over to third because i'm not sure how high yeah. on joey wendell and mike bros mike brasso the rays yeah. are yeah um i mean they seem like consistent ball players but as far mm-hmm. as star players over there i'm not really sure so i guess it's kind of a toss-up what they want to do there Correct. um in the future but i don't think they need to worry about that right now let they they can give franco the time he needs to develop and yeah. let adamas continue to man short for the time being and then when they cross that when that bridge comes to show you know they can they can figure something out then yep yeah and he's He's the number one guy, according to, I think, everybody. I think everyone has him as the number one prospect, so a lot to look for there. Uh, jumping over to something we haven't done all week, but we will do at the very end of each week that we cover uh, for each division. We're going to give our final our final rundown of the division, how we think it's going to play out, um, and where we think each team is going to place. So, Stephen, why don't you go ahead and, and run down your AL East for 2021? Yeah, so I'm sticking. Yankees are going to win the East this year. Um, I've got them with 97 wins. I think they're going to have the number one record in the American League. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to pick against them. And yeah. just kind of looking at what they've got going in and even – even though we talked about how injuries can be an issue for them. Sure. Um, I still think they're the team to beat in the American league. I've got them winning the division. I've got the blue Jays finishing second. Okay. I'm, I'm really confident in this team this okay. year. They've got a lot of swagger. They got a lot of, uh, they got a lot of hope. Even if this year isn't a great year for them, they still have a lot of hope in their future, but I'm very confident in this team. I've got them with 89 wins. The Rays, I'm going to say they're going to finish with 86, which I think is still good. Wow. Okay. It's, and it's just because Kevin Cash and his coaching staff have a really good reputation of making – they've made this team better than they probably should be. Mm. I think that they are still going to be a threat, just not – in the same way they have been the last couple of years. I've got them with 86 wins. Red Sox, I'm going to say they're going to get 78 this year. And then the Orioles, I've got them with 66. Okay. Yeah, that's not bad. I'm not – I'm a little little flip-flopped, but not, not crazy far off. Um, I have the Yankees winning the division uh, by nine games. I have them going 102 and 60. Uh, you know, each, each full season that Aaron Boone has had with this team, he's won 100 games. You could almost argue as a better pitching staff now than he did with guys like Jay Happ and James Paxton, either being hurt or pitching like like poop. So that's kind of how that's kind of how I have the Yankees setting up. Um, Tampa Bay, I have going 93 and 69 and finishing as the the number two wild card team. Um, I do figure that there will probably be a team, um, whether it be Houston um, out Houston or at uh, Oakland I have one of those two winning the division and the other one close behind uh, we'll get into those guys in a couple of weeks but I figure one of those teams will probably be the number one wild card spot so I have Tampa Bay as the number two wild card 
Um, that's also assuming we have no expanded expanded playoffs. Um, I, I think have, I think expanded playoffs got taken off because the NL yeah. didn't want the DH, or that was the only reason the NL was going to get the DH. And yes. it sounds like that's not happening anymore. Yeah. So you know that's that's how I have the Rays set up. Um, Toronto, I have the Blue Jays at ninety and seventy two. I have them just missing the playoffs, but. I do have them at 90 wins. Um, I think they're, I think they're prepared. I think they're ready uh, with the, the acquisition of Steven Matz. Um, I think, yeah, he's not a great starter, but he does still make them better. Um, so I have them at 90 and 72 ready to, ready to burst open in, in you know, next year. Uh, I have Boston at 80 and 82. Yeah. I had them a little close. Yeah, I think 80 wins was my ceiling. Um, 80 or 81 was my ceiling so I kind of have them at the at the top of that ceiling um, I, I see them being relatively uh, competitive but you know not not overly overly winning or anything like that and then I have uh, the Baltimore Orioles finishing 70 and 92 respectable for the kind of roster that they're going to put together um, and I think they're they're definitely not far off from uh some level of competition. Yeah, those are good picks. I think uh, to note on the Red Sox, I do think they're going to be a lot better than maybe what paper shows right now. Yeah. And I just say that because it's the Red Sox and it's really, it hard. it's hard to imagine them being a terrible team. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this division is going to be an exciting one to watch. Absolutely. There's a lot of bright future in this division for most of these teams, if not all of them. So yeah, mm-hmm. um, you know, give us your thoughts too on social media. Tell us yeah, what you I, think. Yeah, drop yeah. drop your drop your standings. I will personally go into these comments and I will debate anybody on these standings. Yeah, we would love to hear. We'd love to hear your opinions, and we'll post ours up again too. Uh, yeah. Just so then you know it's on paper, and if you guys, if you can either tell us how wrong we are at the end of the season, or you can just be silent when we're right about it. One or the other. Yeah. Whichever one if, you prefer. If nobody comments, I'm just going to assume that everyone who looked at it uh, figures that I'm going to be, I'm going to be correct. Um, the Yankees are going to win not only the AL East, but the world series in the next 10 world series. If I get no comments, <laughs> if I get no comments. It's done. It's set in stone. You could just, just start chiseling the, the trophies out now. Yeah, put this Yankee fan in his place. Put all Yankees fans in their place. Tell them, <laughs> tell them why, tell them why they're not the the grid the gridiron team that they once were. It's okay yeah. though. I think they'll get back to that point at some point. No, we're not. <laughs> it, we we went to like eight World Series in nine years back in the fifties. Like that's you take you take like the nineteen the late forties through the early sixties out of that, and the Yankees are like like ten World Series. So. Yeah, but you also didn't have as many teams in the league either, you so the competition yeah. wasn't as steep. Yep. yep, you take out that like 15 year span, and the Yankees are just like everybody else. So, <sighs> yeah, but back then players would, you know, if you got to third base, you grab a beer and smoke up a cigar in the in the clubhouse. It's back when men played baseball. Yeah, yeah, 70 years ago. Yeah. But, well, we thank you guys for being with us this week uh, as we break down the AL East. We're going to do the NL East next week, starting with the Washington Nationals on Monday. Mm-hmm. Um, be sure to give us follows on our social media pages. Uh, Twitter handle is at Dugout Talk One. Facebook page is Dugout Talk. YouTube channel is Dugout Talk. And be sure to give us your thoughts as well. Who do you think is going to win the American League East? Um, Tell us why you think they're going to win the American League East. Mm -hmm. Give us your lineup predictions, whatever you want to do. You know, be don't be afraid to share with us and others uh, what you guys think. Share this podcast with your friends, your family, the barista, your coffee shop, uh, whoever you can think of. Uh, we love to we're loving all the support that we've been getting so far and uh, we continue to appreciate you guys and are very grateful for all of you who have listened to us every day and have been uh, spreading the word around to others that you can think of with this podcast we want to be doing this as consistently as possible Mm -hmm. yeah we're we are just two dudes trust me we have we have very little going on Um, you would not be taking up our time Con- contact me personally like that that'd be cool i'd love to love to talk with you know anyone who you know considers themselves 
maybe a, a fan, you know, uh, an early fan. If you were the first person to, to drop a like, you know, let me know. We'll keep your name written down. We'll thank you at the end of every episode if we need to, you know, anything for you guys. Yeah. And to go with that, if you want to follow us personally on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is boss 2622. The two O's are zeros. Um, and then for Cameron at victory yep. one, eight, three, two, if you Correct. want to follow us personally on Twitter, that's also my PSN. So if you play any video games on uh, PlayStation, feel free to let me know. Very nice. Well, that's going to do it for us. Uh, yep. Thank you for tuning in this week. We're taking the weekend off. We're out of uh, here. We hope you guys enjoy your weekend as well. I believe the Pro Bowl is going on this weekend, uh, Sunday. Yeah, I did believe. you see they're they're doing that? They're they're doing Madden. They're like they're playing Madden. They're not actually playing a Pro Bowl. I don't oh, think. they're not actually. Play- I mean, that makes sense. Um, yeah, interesting. I've never been too high on the Pro Bowl to be completely honest. I've wa- no. I think I've watched it maybe twice. Yeah, um, I, I it's I, I used to like it. Um, when they played in like in in Hawaii, like I always thought that was cool. I think I think that kind of kind of had you know player spirits were a little higher because like you know it's not all that not all that often that you can go to Hawaii, um, especially to go to Hawaii and and do your job, which is play a game. So yeah, I think I think that was really cool. Um, I will miss them not doing like the the special challenges that they had. Like the quarterbacks would have like the the accuracy targets and you know you get points and. They used to have do- they had dodgeball tournaments, and so I think it'll be it'll you know it's unfortunate, but it's better safe than sorry. Yeah, the the those little competitions actually were pretty neat for yeah. for like a Pro Bowl event. Um. Well, anyway, thank you again for being with us this week. We'll be back on Monday when we start the National League East breakdown, starting with the Washington Nationals. With that said, Stephen Gossman, Cameron Lingle, and we are signing off. See you all Monday. See you guys.